Hello, hello, welcome to another brand new episode of Tea with Tea Pod, the only podcast that brings you tea as a day hot. And uh, speaking about tea, this episode is proudly sponsored by Lipton, my face. Now, today my guest is someone who has put Nigeria on the map with her culinary skills. She's a media personality, an actress, and a very talented chef. Her name is Hilda Bassi. Please put your hands together for my guests. <laughs> my friends, I said to introduce you. As <laughs> How are you doing now? I'm good. Finally, we're having a discussion. I'm telling you. Mm, how are you feeling today? I feel good though. It's been a good day. I've actually been in a good mood since morning. Like why? Why are you in a good mood? A good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to talk about. I don't. I, I don't want to go there. But, yeah, but I probably know why you're in a good, good mood. Day. We're, yeah. we're grateful. Welcome to TVT. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Before I said, I have to say I'm, I'm very proud of your journey because I mean, I I knew I knew you from way back and from way most, back when. From a while ago, when you had all these lofty dreams, yep. and some of us were just like, ah, oh, you that don't start again. But <laughs> you finally got here, and it's not a lie. It's, it's something that we should be we should clap for you for. Please put your hands together again for my guests. Yay. Okay, you know this podcast as it is. We go back to background. We need to check what's, <laughs> who this person really is. Why right. she, why is she the way she is? Right. So let's go back, 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 back. Who was Hilda? Who is Hilda before all of this? Before the cooking, if you if you sat with yourself and you looked in the mirror, yeah, how would you describe yourself? That's I feel like that's such an easy question, but it's such a difficult question yeah. to answer. But I'll say Hilda is a very like she's a very ambitious young lady, you know, and it's almost like her ambitions are constantly growing as the day grows, and just as her success is like evolving, mm -hmm. so are her dreams constantly evolving as well. But you know, at heart. I'm still like a very simple, very playful, mm -hmm. you know, girl. I'm the second born girl um, of seven kids. Sounds like a lot. Your mom has seven. I used to be like, technically we're five. But then the, every time someone asks me, I'm like, technically we're five. But the last borns are triplets, so we're seven. Right. <laughs> yeah. You have triplets. That's so yeah. cute. Yeah. I have triplets. So there are two girls and a boy. Darren, Daniel, and, Daniel, and Daniela. So, who's the first is a boy? The first is a boy. My elder brother, Gilbert. Mm -hmm. A lot of people tend to think that he's my younger brother. That boy now you Yeah, he's older. He's older than me by two years. Like so, I used to be like, yeah, technically we're twins. Right. <laughs> you act like his big sis. I mean... I actually don't. Mm. So, I feel like a lot of people just assume that. Just because... I feel like when you're the one that's out there, like everybody knows your name and things like that, they right. just feel like, oh... Mm. It, it, People tend to attribute success to time and experience, which is which is fair. But in in our like families, like no, it's Gilbert, then there's me, mm -hmm. then there's Princess, then David, and then and the triplets. triplets. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so tell me about growing up. I'm, I'm very interested in what your um, childhood was like. Cause also, I, I I saw videos of your mother. Yeah. And you know, she's talking about cooking and everything that you guys, you know. And you also told me about some things that happened mm -hmm. to you. Growing up. Growing up. So, um, I would say my childhood was very, to, to the best of what I can remember. I was born in Calabar. Um, I was there till I was about four or five, until I was about five years old. When they had my kid sister, Princess, then we moved to Abuja to live with my uncle. Right. And my mom moved first. I think she couldn't stay. She stayed for a few months. She couldn't stay without us. So, she came back and she took us to um, Abuja. She was doing her IT at the time. So she was doing her IT in Ministry of Defense. And eventually, she put us in school. So we went to St. Aloysius um, International School, one mm -hmm. school in Abuja. And, you know, it was that. She was still doing her IT. Then eventually, I could just remember that I came back from school one day and I remember my mom making food in the night. And, you know, waking up early in the morning and making food and then she was taking it to her office. Obviously, now that I'm grown, I, like, I now know that it was that, you know, the food at the canteen wasn't very good. So she made food for herself and took it to work. And then a couple people tried her food and they were like, ah, the food is really good. Oh, please bring for me tomorrow, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. she brought a bit extra. And then people started asking, like, oh, can I order it? And that's how she's like, okay, let's make like 20 packs. Then she would take it to the office and then 20 packs finished. She increased it to 50 packs. And over time, the demand became so much that she got like that. I don't know if you know those umbrellas that they used to sell recharge card. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so she got like that umbrella for a recharge card. So she was making about a hundred packs, and then she would just put it there. She put a girl there to just help. So people were now coming across. While she was in IT. Yeah, in Ministry of Defense. So they would just come across the road to buy, mm -hmm. and gradually. So opposite Ministry of Defense was this huge field. Not really a field, but like a parking space. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of like vendors. So they, it's like trampoline now, like mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay. mm -hmm. I know. You know. So she now got like her own space too. Did her own trampoline. And then she started from jollof rice. She now added egusi soup. She now added rice and stew. And basically just from there, that was how mm -hmm. she started like her cooking business. And I remember that there were at least maybe 30 vendors at the time. And this is me trying to be safe, you know. And they kept coming to demolish those places because it was an illegal structure. Yes, you're, yes, you're not yes. supposed to be there. Yeah. But some way, somehow, my mother was able to find her way to get into environmental, you know, speak to the um, environmental guys, now try to get a permit where from over 30 vendors, it was now just her. So it was the legal selling occupant. Food. And that was such a gold mine because in that space, there was Ministry of Defense across there was Chinese embassy, there was UNICEF, wow. you know, there was the American embassy. So it was like the embassy. And mm -hmm. you know how the embassies are, there's like a lot of guys, mm -hmm. girls, like trying to get their visas mm -hmm. and all that. So I remember having a lot of uncles and aunties that used to come and buy food and they would dash me Morning. 50 naira, mm -hmm. 200. I, I I would help my mom out and I'll go, when I come back from school, I'll be like, oh, we have Gary Fufu Semos. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It was such a thing. I remember even going to school one time and we're coming out for, like, an excursion. And me, what's my business? I told my school that, ah, my mommy sells food, though, around this place. If we go, my mom will give all of us food. That's how our teacher drove us to... When I was in secondary school, yeah. um, I was in FGC Rubochi, yeah. my first secondary school. Mm -hmm. And we went there, and my mommy literally fed everybody. Mm -hmm. And it was just a yeah. So that was pretty much my childhood, just... Us, you know, there were so many kids. This called us cheaper by the dozen. I don't even know that movie. Yeah, yeah. Where there were so many kids. kids. So that yeah. was how we were in my house. So all seven of you lived with your mom. Yes. She made sure that all of you lived. I mean, she didn't have the triplets. It was just she didn't have oh, by David that time, even. Right. Like I seen your David like fifteen years. Oh. So no, it was just me, Gilbert, Princess, and then there was Ugo. My my, I call her my elder sister, but she's like my cousin. Then there was Becky Mama. So I have an auntie that is my age mate. So my, my technically it's like my grandma and my mom were pregnant at the same ah! time. I love it. <laughs> you know, so it was all of us. My uncle, then some of my uncles, like um, younger siblings as well. All Carlo, of us. All of us. You know, you know that's and this was a three bedroom apartment. Yeah. You know, all those houses that they give like ministry of like mm -hmm. all these directors, I mean, what they mm -hmm. call them. That was where we were staying. But we we had the best time. So yeah. I obviously I had other kids around. We used to get up to different kinds of mm -hmm. mischief. I, so I'll say I had a good childhood, honestly. I actually did. So, cooking for you started early? Yeah. With I your mom? That, you, yes. you enjoyed cooking with your mom? No. Eh? <laughs> I did not enjoy cooking with my mom. No. So, it wasn't a passion from... It wasn't a passion from... If I tell you that that's me trying to cook up his stories, that's a lie. Really? It, you know, it was, it was something that I watched my mom do. Then... I started trying it out. Obviously, they'll drag you to the kitchen mm. they, when they want to cook. They've mm. gone to market. So come and do this, mm. come and do that. But I remember when I started getting more interested in cooking was I made spaghetti. And then the reviews on the spaghetti was so good. How old were you then? I think I was like eight. Eight? Yeah, maybe like eight, six or eight. One of the two. So this was a talent that you had, but you didn't want to explore yeah, because so I'm I cooking mean, is work, Yeah, so I mean, spaghetti, and everybody really likes it. I remember when we now travel to Calabar, because we used to go to Calabar every Christmas. Because mm -hmm. then my dad stayed, stays in Calabar. So mm -hmm. when we go to Calabar, my mom now called me to come and make that spaghetti for like Auntie Lizzie. <laughs> and, you know, so to show say I, was, yeah, I was feeling myself. So I, I feel like maybe I liked the attention. Yes. You know, that sort of came and... It's so weird that yes, they said. I think you've always liked the person that came to people eating your food yes. for, for the longest time. You enjoyed feeding people. Yes, I actually I actually do. Mm -hmm. I did and I still do. Yeah. So yeah. So let's talk about your dad. Why why did you have to live with just your mom? Mm, honestly, I would say it was the quest for a better life. Right. Obviously, my dad had like some jobs that he was doing in mm -hmm. Calabar. But we were not 
buoyant at all. I, I mean, I, I can't remember these things, but my mom tells me right. that we weren't, we weren't rich. We weren't even average. We were struggling. And then my uncle came. My uncle was living in... Um, my uncle, this is like my grandma's brother. He's late now, God rest his soul. You know, he came to Calabar. I saw my mom and I told my mom that, oh, she can come to Lagos to, do her, to Abuja to do her IT. And maybe she can, you know, get a bit more money from there. So she can be making some mm-hmm. small money for herself, yes. for the kids. Mm-hmm. And then my mom went to Abuja, but she couldn't stay. Like, she couldn't stay without her children. Right. So I think she came back and had a conversation with my dad. I was like, let me just take them. That way they can even go to good schools. And mm-hmm. my mother was so intentional mm-hmm. about, like, us. So she wanted us to go to good schools. She had these very big dreams for us. So she felt like us coming to Abuja was definitely going to help those dreams come true. Mm-hmm. So she came back and then she picked us and took us to um, Abuja. But I feel like maybe the caveat there was that every December we had to come yes. back yes. to Calabar. So I remember every December always going back mm-hmm. and to see my dad. I remember mm-hmm. this one December that we went back and he got us, like we all had bicycles. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. So it was really, it was really cool. So yeah. So like your mom decided to moved to Abuja to raise you guys. How, that must have been difficult because a single mom, yeah, three kids. It was, it was, it was very difficult. Yeah. And my mom is not even, she wouldn't just want to take us. She wants to take us, maybe one of my daddy's sisters or one of her siblings. So it wasn't even just us. It yeah. was like us. Then Uncle Samuel came. Uncle Samuel is late now. God rest his soul. Mm. Uncle Samuel came. and Sikwa came. So there was still like, there was just more people mm-hmm. coming you know, and it was that, but it wasn't easy. I remember I was moving out of my uncle's place to one one um apartment, like a one room apartment, mm-hmm. and I think she wasn't comfortable with how we're living there. Yeah. So she took us back to my uncle's place, and then started trying to save up to get like a bigger house, mm. and then she did, and then we now moved to like our own house that we're not staying with my uncle anymore. So yeah. But like. You know, things started looking up when the cooking business started, right? For my mom, yes. It's yeah. almost like we have the same story, yeah. you know, but there are just a few, like, differences, differences here yeah. and there. So, like, so so this is your mom who moved to Abuja, started at IT, trying to get her kids to go to good schools. All of a sudden, this break opens up, she starts cooking. Yes. And, and the business was, was thriving. And she was making a lot of money. Wow. She was making... My brother went to Ibinidio. Okay, that was yeah. a lot of money then. I went to federal government college, Rubochi. It wasn't going well. I I was I kept falling sick. Mm. Then she took me to Oasis International College. Mm-hmm. I was there up until the time that that my auntie that happens to be my age mate was mm-hmm. also going to be going into SS two, and my mom is like, oh, she doesn't think it would be fair if I was in a private school and she was like in a government, government school. school. So what she did was now take me out of the private school. Mm-hmm. And because she couldn't afford to put us both there. Mm-hmm. So she now put both of us in Federal Government Girls College, Abaji, Abuja. Mm-hmm. So that was where we finished from. And that was what sort of took me out. But, and then my kid, sis, my kid sister went to, oh, I can't remember her, her primary school, but it was some expensive, you know, mm-hmm. primary school. And my mother was pretty much like paying for all that, you know. I remember my dad did contributed a bit mm-hmm. because, again, in terms of like finances, my dad wasn't doing as well as my mom at the time. Mm. But I do remember him like with every money he was making, with everything, like he would he would struggle to be like the best staff at the time. And um he would I think at the time he was working in mobile, so he was a driver in mobile. Mm-hmm. And I think when they did like their end of year, whatever, whatever, mm-hmm. maybe like appraisal or whatever, mm-hmm. there was always like this place that they had provisions and things like that. So my dad would, would get that award, go and pick as many nice fancy provisions as he could and he would send, send it to it, us yeah. in Abuja and they would bring it to me in school. So I had like really, so it was so weird because my mommy was very extra. You would think that my parents were rich. Yes. Not rich, but you would think my but parents okay. were doing better than they were yeah. because my mom would go into a store and buy the nicest bag for me maybe mm. the bag with all the glitters mm-hmm. she would buy me different shoes mm. she used to always bring new clothes for me to mm. try on during visiting days like she was very intentional yeah. I don't remember she didn't let you guys feel whatever oh, was happening at the time at all like when we go for parties we were DBS dressed mm-hmm. like her children had to for her it was almost like her children were a reflection of her so yes. she it's however she wanted people to see her that she so she invested heavily. But I know that she was a smart child. Did you know what was really going on? No. no. So she masked everything for you. Yes, guys. she, you know, yeah. 
So it didn't seem... So again, I feel like my mommy was very... It didn't feel like a struggle. It didn't feel... Especially when my mommy started her food business. Right. She was very content in a way. So mm-hmm. it didn't feel like we were struggling or we were suffering. It was maybe when I got older that I would know that my mom had money problems here and yeah. there. Like some of these big dreams of sending us to these expensive schools used to take it Sacrifice, toll. yeah. But at the time, no, I didn't feel it. I didn't, no, I didn't think about it. Because trust me, they were not missing my visiting days, my provision. Bills were sorted. At least people that went to Abadji, they can remember that. Mm. Me and Becky, I don't, I don't remember anybody's provision being more than ours, like mm. to the best of my knowledge, right. just because my mother was, she would buy cartons of everything. She was very... She works so Yeah, hard. she, yeah. So all her money she spent on her children, not on herself. She reminds me of my grandma. That's amazing. But like, I'm I'm thinking, what did she go to any school for you to, for you to be able to cook that good? Yeah. Because I I stumbled on her on her Instagram. Yeah. Yeah, like it about to cook anything. Do this. <laughs> yeah, rude. Anything. Where she where are you gonna see the turning? Eh. The way she the mixer. I said, ah, this woman it's is going. angry. She's like, did she learn to cook somewhere? Did she, not really. You? Honestly, it's just talent. Yeah. Yeah, your mama the cuckoo. Still, that Instagram page, I saw that Instagram page. She's good. The food is in your face like this, yes. and it looks and it so looks good. good you know, it's so intentional. She, yes, my, I've, I remember vividly that my mom tossed an entire pot of edikai corn when she was in the restaurant because is that they didn't cut it well, or they put a little bit too much seasoning. Mm. One of those two, or salt. It was salt. They put too much salt. It wasn't overly salty, but it was like borderline salty. So it's like, if you don't like salt and you eat that thing, you'll be like, ah, this ain't salty. And we say, no, she's not going to serve this to our customers. She tossed it and made it fresh pot. I, I cannot forget that particular memory. Yeah. So you guys were well-fed kids. Like, imagine your mom owning yes. a restaurant. You know, let's just say, pick it with your mama get restaurant most fat. Because if, if, no. mama fry meat, she's going to put it your mouth. Fry fish, you put it your no mouth. No joke. See, my mother... Maybe it has to do with her own upbringing. Mm-hmm. But to her, having a fat kid was like, yes. you're taking care of your kids. So when we go it? to school, my mommy has like ways that she can make you fat. Like she has recipes. If she sold it today, it will, it will go. So when we come back from school, like I remember when I was mm. with Uchi, when I came back, I was very skinny. My mommy will mix more some milk with egg. <laughs> she will now mix ugu water ugu with water, mops, my sister. For, you know, for blood. Yes, for blood. She will now give us noodles mm. with, with vegetable, with egg, with chicken. You you must eat. Yes, yes. You must, what? You'll be healthy. A healthy child must be like, robust. Like, you must be. Then when you, we now got older, and you're now big, she will not say, oh. You're getting too fast. Isa, you have put on. <laughs> now you start up. <laughs> now you start up. My mommy, Ooh. you don't want to feed me, please. <laughs> That's amazing. So tell me, what kind of person were you in secondary school? Because thinking about you now, I'm, yeah, I'm embarrassed of. I'm like, I'm literally embarrassed for the person I was. Just tell me about that girl. Who was that girl? I Who was Hilda from secondary school? I wouldn't say I was timid, but I was very not so aware of who I was. Yeah. So I, I was the kind of kid that, and this is me being honest, you know. I used to crave some form of acceptance, you know. So I was that girl that wanted to be friends, yeah. you know. I wanted to have to like, you, yeah. I felt like I sort of needed that like validation, validation. you know. So where was that? I don't know. Maybe daddy issues, yeah. you know. Same here, Maybe, my friend. Yeah. So it was, it was that. Mm. Like, I, I don't know. I feel like I've, I've gone past that now. But I remember mm. this one time. When I was in primary school and we're graduating from primary school, mm-hmm. and my auntie Becky had come to, um, had come to um, Abuja to now live with us, yeah. and I can't remember what it was that day, but something had happened, and I think they were blaming her or something, and I was like, just leave the poor girl alone, and this is me feeling like, oh, I'm my I'm friend. in this good school, so I I'm, like I this saying poor girl doesn't mean she's poor. poor it yeah. just means you got like you guys are picking on her leave mm-hmm. her alone and i remember that being taken out of context and i was severely attacked by becky at home not oh, becky right. it was like my grandma so i remember for the longest time where i felt like my grandma did not like, like me yeah. and mm. it's still like i mm. started eating onions 
because one day my grandma was saying that oh onions is good for the eyes and i remember in my in my small mind thinking that if i ate enough onions like my it. grandma would like me <gasps> so that's i'm just basically just trying know, to give you like no. an instance yeah. to how my brain works obviously yeah. that wasn't true because no. she's my grandma of course she loves me but to be me. fair to us as kids and, and this is the same thing i tell my my people that you know as children these are our formative years. Like the mm-hmm. things that you do to us always stick. It, so it does. For me, I was raised by my granny. She did her best to show me that you are loved, though. But you know that thing where, on like when you're with your father and your mother, and there's that familiar thing where they're constantly reminding you how welcomed you are, how important you are to them. I don't think I ever got that. I think yeah. that that's why I said I didn't Jesus a lot. Because yeah. I feel like I needed that level of validation that would make me feel very secure. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I just never really got that from. My granny had some money. We said went to good schools, but you know, I I think I had a lot of daddy issues that made yeah. me just feel like I needed an. You extra. needed like external validation. So I, I feel would like... go out of my way to do things for people, even when I didn't feel like. You, you know, know I'm only and let people get away with my so sister. much. You can walk. You could walk over all over me before. Like I would just let it go. Even up to now, like it's still. I'm just learning to say no. Like Bruh, I am just learning to say, not, and even when I say me. no. I still feel so bad, but I'm just like... Like, when I say no, I'd literally tell, like, I'll tell my friend that, or I'll tell my man, I'll be like, I practiced an act of self-care today. Yes. I said no to something that I don't, I wasn't happy with. Yes. And it's so, I feel like it's so profound because Mm. it's, I used to say that it was an entire journey just going from secondary school, because again, Mm -hmm. I'll just shrug that off to being young, Mm -hmm. being naive, Mm -hmm. And when I got into the university, I started getting better. I started, you know, spending a bit more time with myself. But even then, you know, there was still this friend of mine that used to trigger this certain, like, memories of me where when we have an argument, she'd just be like, oh, don't ever talk to me, mm. you know? And things. Like, and for me, that's such a red flag. Now, if you try that rubbish with me, I'm off. I've blocked you. Like, I won't mm. block you, but, like, I'm done. I'm mm. not doing that with mm. you because it just... I feel like they were just maybe their triggers from yeah, my for, childhood yes, that yes. I probably can't remember but yeah. just make that feel really weird for me. You know, but it's also like a rejection thing. Like, it's like when I get rejected, it, it kills me. Yes. It's like you don't want to, like, if you reject me, <laughs> I will shut down, I will run to, like, I will run to my naughty corner. Like, I will be a different yeah. person. And and it's, it's, it's that lack of validation that I I. Um, receptive than I was like proactive so it's like mm. I wouldn't initiate a friendship it's not me like yes. you have you have to like be the one to make the move yes. to be my friend my friend but then when you're my friend I, I pay attention to the kind of person you are if I feel like oh there's love here mm-hmm. then I would I would allow yeah. myself to flourish I make friends easily though. me too you know so you know that thing where they used to say, choose your friends, don't allow your friends to choose you. Technically, in my in my in my case, mm. I would not necessarily say I choose my friends, but I don't walk into a room and be like, I want to be friends with this person. No, it's like I'm in this room, Whoever. a bunch of you notice me, mm-hmm. some of you like me, some of you gravitate towards me, then I decide mm. who I'm going to give my attention to. I feel like because of how I was raised. It takes me a while to be... And friendship is really vulnerability. Yes, it's, it's the true. That's what keeps you... But that's what actually, like, yes. bonds you guys. It's saying that I choose you and you choose me. Mm-hmm. But for me to get to that place where I'm extremely vulnerable, I've had to cross different layers with two several C's. Like, I'm just like, that's my guy. <laughs> it takes a while. So, I, like, if you had to count your friends, like you say, your I don't close have friends to, off the top of your hand. Like, top of your head. You don't have to say it. Don't put me on the spot. 
Just say. I don't. I know that they will not come. You know, this thing. Excluding family. I know my family, sir. So just like your friends. Like, who? Can you, how many? By the time I leave this podcast, I go and count more. But I think they they feel not complete these ten fingers. So let me give you context, right? Yeah. I started separating acquaintances from my friends. My friends are my safe space. Acquaintances, we I'm I'm a perfect Libra. I can shape shift. Once yeah, I get into a space, right? I can bond with everybody, but not deeply connect. And after I leave there. Yeah, I'm kind of similar to it's like. But my real guys now I know me when they when they reach yeah. out to see my friend. I saw it happen to do. <laughs> Outside, I'm see, I still have the same personality, but it's you cannot. For me to be vulnerable with you it means that. Yeah. Ha. Ah, because I hate to finish. That's another problem. Oh, I'm so. My like, friend, if you see me finish, I I rather would never meet. Like, see, I feel like that's the easiest way to lose me. Mm. Just. See finish. Just see finish now. I'm off. If I like you enough, I will remove myself, but still allow access. Yeah. yeah. But like yeah. when I know that, okay, this and I, I think in a way, what I would say is sometimes it's not necessarily about you. That's what I've come to understand. Mm-hmm. That is more about when people sort of idolize you. Mm-hmm. So imagine someone saying, Oh, I really want to be friends with you. And then they are successful and they become friends with you. Like you said, friendship, what sort of makes friendship a lot more solid is vulnerability. So it means I'm telling you things about myself. Mm-hmm. I'm a bit more open. I'm more expressive with you. So things that I wouldn't admit to other people, I'd you admit will. to you. Mm-hmm. Now, what happens with these people that, you know, some, some set, like certain personalities is because they've idolized you. The minute they now humanize you because they now see like you for the human you that, that you are. are. They demystify they, you. Yes, they no longer mm-hmm. sort of value you, that idol yeah. that they saw before. Yeah. And because the minute I realized that that's how like humans can be, I made a conscious effort to know that, you know, it's important to not idolize anybody mm-hmm. just so that you can see them for the humans that they are and you can continue to treat them with the same love and respect and regard that they deserve, mm. you know, to be treated with. But it takes, in truth, it actually takes a lot of self-reflection and just like self-awareness to get to that point where you can be honest about things like that. So in a way, as much as I have certain like um, iffy moments from like my childhood, I honestly appreciate that because I feel like it's what it's those things and those experiences that has made me the kind of person I am today. Mm. And I I really like the person I am. Like, I actually, like, I like myself. Like, when I think of myself, I actually really like myself. It's a powerful place to be. Yeah. You sound so brilliant. <laughs> I know you're smart, but you don't know you're smart like this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no. I why me. Wait, 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 wait. Let's yeah. talk about daddy issues. I need to talk about daddy issues. <laughs> oh, my I God. I have daddy issues. You have daddy issues. Oh, Just yeah. Let's talk about it. You know. Yeah, so. But guess what? For the longest time, I didn't realize how much, how, that I was dealing with daddy issues. Oh, me, I knew. I was well aware. I mean, I studied sociology and for the first three years, you have to do like a bit of intensive psychology when mm-hmm. you do that. So and when you start to read, like my brother mm-hmm. is a big reader. So he's like pushing you to like expand your mind, understand yourself, you know, and things like that. So the more you do that, the more you read, the more you understand like mm-hmm. things about yourself. And so I knew that I had daddy no, There were some reactions I that, it. that I, I had to think. I'm just like, ah. Oh. These not daddy issues. So, you know, I used to, I used to, there's, first of all, my friends were always older than me. And I realized that I, I, I bonded more with those friends because I needed some sort of mature, what's the word? The things that I missed in my, with my father, I wanted them, that in those friends. Yeah. And I realized that I would not, I couldn't even make friends with my mates. I wanted, to, even with relationships, I probably was interested in people older than me. Yeah. You know? Just to feel that level of security. I think that's that's actually very like very relatable. For me, I would say I would say one of the biggest things with my daddy issues is more abandonment. You know, I d- so in, if I was to classify the kind of daddy issues that I have, and what did you put inside this? Please, I had that. I feel like I'm okay, so too much. if I go to talk like this, no, this is still tape, but this is what happens here. The Holy Spirit is here. It's good to release all the things that you're holding back. People are you laughing. The Holy prayed. Spirit is here. Anyway, 
I think I have both daddy and mommy issues. If it's abandonment, that's my... Let's just bond over our trauma. Uh, <laughs> you know, so for me, I w- again, I really love my mom just because, you know, I feel like having her pretty much... I don't know the way I soothe a lot mm. of these issues. But yes. for me, my daddy issues stems a lot from, like, abandonment. Yes. Yes. And obviously, my dad didn't abandon me from the Mine onset. Did. It wasn't that. It was, I, I feel like my dad was present to an extent, at least to the best of my memory, to like how I can remember us. Right. My dad was present. My dad tried like what he could. But when he came down to it, and you know where they say parents have issues, like when the elephants are fighting at this, the ground, the suffering. it's suffering. So I feel like we, the kids, were the ground mm-hmm. that suffered when the elephants were fighting. Yeah. You know, so it was, if, it was very much more they had issues yeah. and then we were collateral damage yeah. from my dad yeah. and I feel like why it's so profound for me is more the fact that I was already in like my 300 level second semester so if you're to think about the stress that comes with having a child is training them through primary school secondary mm-hmm. school university and then once they get out of it if you can't afford to send them to their masters it's like go and start making money yes. for yourself. Yes. So it, in my opinion is that we were pretty much already, like at least my brother and I, were very much almost out of that, that phase where we're constantly asking for money or mm-hmm. anything like that. And my dad is like, oh, I disown you, that kind of thing. So I, I pretty much still remember the conversation where I was calling my dad because I think it was matric, matriculation. Mm-hmm. So it was probably first semester or second semester. I was matric and I was calling my dad and I'm like, do you not bring food for me, this matric, you know? Mm-hmm. And then his response to me is, who's your dad? You know? <sighs> I don't know why I'm speaking funny, but people will collect it like that. <laughs> but he was like, who's your dad? You know, and I'm like... Uh, did anything happen before then? So that was when it sort of dawned on me that there was issues, like the way Between they both. were having issues. Nice. And then obviously years later, my brother is telling me that he had called my dad and said, whatever issues you're having, let's not affect the kids. Because obviously he's older, older yeah. smarter. Yeah. You know. And I just remember like just going on from that time mm. and... Just as time went on, it just, got used it just started to dawn on me that oh, this this man is serious. So like, okay, this so is not a joke. By my, by your matric, you got into uni. No, no, no. This was not, this is not my own matriculation. I mean, three hundred level. Right. You guys, so, but it's matric, so parents were allowed to come yeah. into school. I couldn't imagine that. So, so before then, he had never come to school. He had never reached. He had come for my my own matriculation. My daddy was in my school with Ghana must go on his head. It's oh. like a fang soup and stew. That he brought for so me you, on you, matric day. You at that level can understand. Where, so it's like what the for me, is. it's like you know how you feel like oh you're so loved that you know. Then one day I di- I I didn't have like the not just me again I have siblings mm-hmm. me Gilbert Princess we didn't have like the nu- you know when they taught us in school nuclear and extended family yeah. we did not have the nuclear family father mother and yes, children it yes, was my yes. my childhood was never me like too. that mm-hmm. but I knew like I had a dad he was you had people he, around he was there he tried you know he was. You know, he made the efforts that mm-hmm. he could. Again, mm-hmm. I cannot speak to the issues he had with my mom mm-hmm. because I was not advanced enough to even have those kinds of conversations. Mm-hmm. But for me, it's like what's m- most important to me is that I'm your child. Yes. Not me. We are your children. Acts right by us. Yeah. Right? Like, so for me, it's like, so I, I said, I didn't say that, but years later, I'm like, oh, I feel like a few years has passed, you know. So in my opinion, I kind of feel like what my dad was hoping for was that in this period, we were going to come forth and maybe find him, you know, like, be like, mm. oh no, this is it. But again, the way he had gone about it mm. at the time, he was he was very mean, you know, yeah. about it. And then even after that, I feel like when you've been mean, because I feel like if I'm even, I don't have it in me to be mean, but in an event that I am, Mm-hmm. I would think about it and be like, oh, just because I was mean, even if I had a point, mm-hmm. maybe I should reach out to this person. Yes. Mm-hmm. Which is why I'm not so quick to speak down on people mm-hmm. or talk bad to people just because I remember how it, it feels. feels. Yeah. So I don't want anybody to have that say. I don't want to be the reason why somebody has trauma. Yes. You know, so I'm yes. very careful. Yeah. Even with my staff, you yeah. know, I'm very careful. Yeah. You know, so for me, it was just after that, I just felt like, you know, time has passed, you know. Mm-hmm. Don't you miss me? Yeah. So I started telling myself that I need to make it. If I make it hard enough, he will love. If I blow well enough, this man will come around. Exactly. I think that's what happened to me too. Like you see, it now becomes Did a they come fraud. Around? 
Did come out? So my own case, I don't, this is the first time I'm talking about it, right? My dad and mom were teenage lovers. So they had me early. So my granny had to raise me. But it was just a thing where <clears throat> my dad tried at some point, though, but the only time that he that I that he chose me, somebody got in the way. Um, his like, his like, wife, his oh, new wife. Shit. And this is going to go viral. I don't know. She's going to see it. But for, I felt rejection in the highest level. I felt that my dad chose his wife over, over me you. and has chosen her till today and his new family. So for me, I think I got for that. You know, so when all of that happened, and I was 13, 14, right? So I felt like from that moment till now, I've been on bad foil. You know what bad foil is? Bad foil is when. The reason why you're trying to be successful is not because, oh, this says so much. There's passion there. You love this, what you do. But you're trying to prove something that, you know, maybe when I get these things, I'll become adequate enough to be seen by them. Yeah. But when I got here, I realized that, oh, there's so much damage that had been done. But Like, you know, it's too bad. It's too bad. And, and I just, that's why I started doing a lot of Jesus again. I'm like, God, please, you have to heal me so that uh, my foil is not, you cannot be using kerosene inside, uh, inside he locks. Yeah. Please, you have to let me be using petrol. Like, you yeah. know, so I feel that's that I only started engaging the reality of that, what that did to me. Mm. So for me, I, I started looking for people that would accept me. And I also thought that my, you know, my granny, I don't know if it feels like I can interview me now, but <clears throat> my granny did the most she could. Mm -hmm. I keep saying that my granny, if, if it wasn't for my granny, I don't think I'll be here. My granny did the most she could, but she was a grandma of multiple grandchildren. Mm. She just had money. But we're lucky that she had enough money to send us to the good schools. But you see that thing where you, the formative years of your child's life, you are there, you are present, you know. Yeah. Like imagine him calling you and saying, who's your dad? Maybe as adults who could have dealt with it better, but you were younger. Yeah. Like, so it adds something in your system. Like, of course. you understand? So right. I think for me, that was that was my only issue. So what, what informed the decision to move to, to Lagos? Presenting, honestly. I just... I wanted to be a TV presenter. Where did that dream come from? Because you were a timid girl. Honestly, I don't even know. You know, I was timid, like, internally. I was very, yeah. like, outspoken, very vocal, very yeah. loud. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was... I saw this audition. A friend of mine, Charles, had sent me an audition for... Charles Lina, already a friend KGTV. from Abuja. Yes. We went to the same university. But Charles was at Abuja. Yeah, too. so he studied library science or something. So mm -hmm. our departments were sort of over, across from each other. Mm -hmm. So he sent me this, um, uh, like, information about, like, an audition for, I think it was MTV VJ Search, even. And then I went to that. I passed a few stages, but I didn't make it. In his, Abuja? In Abuja. Then it was MTV-based, VJ Search. And then um, that was the first time I ever saw a his. He was, I think he was already on yeah. mtv base, so he was one of the guys that were just, the you know, yeah. yeah. And then I got this other um, information for an audition for Linda KG TV, and I auditioned. I did like I was so I went and carried camera crew, <laughs> shot an audition, wrote a script, and the audition did so well. Mm -hmm. I think if you scroll down my page, I I, I feel like I can still remember the script. I, yeah. I can still recite it, and I realized that I was really good at it. Like, you know how you just see that ah, you're thing. so good at something that the desire to now become that thing now sort of yeah. sparks up. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, I'm so good at this. So I came to Lagos, went back for a couple, like stage one, stage two, you know, those kind of back in the day. Mm -hmm. And stage one, stage two to stage waiting, I shall know, they shall not pick me. Like, even though I'd go to the final mm -hmm. eight or something, right. they shall didn't go with me. And that was, I went back to Abuja. Abuja. Then I heard about another call for Inside Out with Agatha. And then I came to Lagos. Inside, you auditioned for Inside Out? Yes, so like, the, um, I think Agatha was retiring, so she was you now... You have been on this thing for a bra. while. So like, I was like, oh, I came and auditioned for Inside Out with Agatha. And mm -hmm. I was so good that they now put me in the house. So there was it was kind of like a house, like mm -hmm. a reality thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't win, but they really... And I was cooking for them, dear. I trust you. So... <laughs> I didn't win, but when I came out, they were like, oh, we'd like to give you a job in Rift TV. And the job was now pretty much to 
host the cooking segment of a breakfast show called Morning Rays. So while I was in that Inside House with Agatha reality thing, Breakfast King, a company, had sponsored the Inside House with Agatha. So the owner of Breakfast King came that day. His name is Bioye. And they gave us food. And I ate the morning. And I gave him feedback. <laughs> Honestly, that what was it. Say? So it was, I just told him that, oh, I feel like the batter needs this. I, you know, I just gave him like constructive mm. feedback. Mm. And that was how we became friends from there. And he now used to just like check in to like ask me, oh, what's up? You know, yeah. what do you think about this? So we're trying this new menu and things yeah. like that. Now, I was now doing this job at Rave TV, but ah, baby girl was still asleep. I used to go for movie audition. I used to do wakapas here and too. there. Uh, I used to do wakapas. You know, I was still doing like other things. Mm. And I was doing that job primarily also because I did not have house. So they were housing me. Oh, Rave? Yes, Rave. They had this you apartment. Saying? You know, so they were housing me there. Where? We had Charles. We were working there. So Where were you guys living? Ilukwedrum. Right. So to be close to be close to work. Yeah, to be close to work. Ah. <laughs> you, try- you, you Charles had a Rave TV era. That's yes. true. So you you also worked there. I worked in Rave TV at the same time actually. And how much did they pay me that time? Twenty five k or something like that. Your TV jobs were always like that. Bro, and I was always bad with money. Trust me. Because so we spent. Yeah, we bought the money. So we don't finish. You know. So you know, I did that, and then I'm like. Ah, I cannot stick here. I have to find another artist that will be giving me money. Mm-hmm. As God we have it. Bioye now told me that they got a job to do lunch for Linkage Assurance. They were a breakfast company, but now they were telling them that, oh, we want you to do lunch for us for, you know, about 200 people every day. And he's like, oh, do you think you can handle this? I say, yeah, I can handle it. I trust you. Nothing we are doing for But handle. by this time, I just said, were you cooking? Like, were you cooking seriously? Yes, no. I used to cook. I used to cook for... Inside out of the when they were doing their taping, mm-hmm. you know, they used to feed the um, people. And I used to cook for them. I mean, I wasn't getting, like, paid per se for mm-hmm. that. But they used to give me money to buy the ingredients, everything, everything to cook. So I used to do that. And this was off just your experience with your mom? No culinary skills? Yes, no, skill, no. No nothing. culinary skills, nothing. You know, so I was cooking. I was cooking for that one. I was doing, like, 400 people every two mm-hmm. weeks or something like that. And then I now started working with Breakfast King. So I was doing that Breakfast King work. So I was now doing Rave TV work. Breakfast King oh, work. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> yes. When I used to hear people read about people doing two jobs. Mm-hmm. On, we did like um, three, four. My sister. I mean, my brother. I say, so I would, I was in Breakfast King. So Breakfast King, my job was pretty much, I wake up at 3 a.m. I would make vegetable sauce that they would take for breakfast. Then... I would continue like my prep. Then maybe if I if I had extra time, if I finished early, I could go back to sleep and wake up at um, five and then come back down and start making lunch. So I used to make about four meals every day for 200 people. So maybe an average of 100 people per pot, things like that. So I'm making afang soup. Yes, I was still doing TV. So I make afang soup, this, this, this. So on the days that I had to do my, inst- my TV um, thing, I would do the vegetable sauce. I would go to um, Rave TV, then I would come mm-hmm. back, then I would, you know, so I would make the food, pack the food, then quickly go shower, dress up, and then I would follow them to Linkage Assurance in Lucky Face One. Mm-hmm. I would serve the food. So, like, you know, people come in, I, I stood, I would serve the food. When we're done, pack up, go back to the mainland. Some days I would go to the market, you know, to sort of restock and things like that. Eventually, over time, we got a staff that used to do that. Mm-hmm. And I was pretty much just supervising. But the cooking, the serving, everything, I did that till I, I resigned. So while I was still doing I did I did that for almost a year. Then I resigned. In the process of me resigning, I told the owner of Rift TV at the time that, oh, I have to go to Abuja because I'm dealing with a lot and all that and all that. Then I went to, you know, Abuja. So While back. I was in Abuja, yes, I Why? was ready to move back because I was just done. I was I was tired of suffering. But well, you the, served. The, yes, Hilda. the Wala was too much, you mm. know. So when I went back, I had put in, you know, an application to have my show, my own show on Pop Central TV. So they had this uh, mutually beneficial contract mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. they had co-creators. So technically, they don't pay you, yeah, but, but they give you like a platform to do your own show. Can it. I mean, I'm a uh, Yes. All I need I is a platform. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so when I went back to Abuja, 
Grave TV now told me that they fired me. So technically, I resigned from Breakfast King, lost my job at Rave TV, was in Abuja, then they told me that I should come to Lagos to come and do a taping, like a pilot shoot for shoot. my show. It was called Dine on a Budget. That mm-hmm. was the, the brief I had sent yeah. in. And I went and I did the pilot shoot and it did so well that they said, okay, they would give me a slot. It was a Sunday slot live from, I think, 4.30 to 5.30 or something like that. And, you know, basically I was required to handle everything that had to do with the show. They yeah. gave me, obviously, the camera crew, the space. Mm-hmm. Then I had to get the guests yes. and everything else. So my the idea of the show was I had a mixologist. I was cooking. And I just wanted it to be so much fun. So I'm like, oh, how do I get people to come here if I'm offering them good food, good cocktails, things like that? So most of your favorite celebrities, if they check their DMs, I mean, I'm there. I was on that show. <laughs> yes. I and mean, you, like... It's so funny yeah. that I thought that you were going to end up as a TV presenter. Yes. I, honestly, because... Because I did that for about two so years. so good. Like, you'd be cooking, you'd be asking us random questions. Yeah. And you had some quality guests. Like, yeah, you, I did. You already had celebrities on your show. Yes, actually. As as like, half the, the celebrities I actually knew at the time. Mm-hmm. It was from doing that show. It was mm-hmm. sending them DMs. Sometimes I'll be so fortunate they'll mm-hmm. respond... I remember Chigo, um, Linda Osefo, mm. you know, um, then tall Tony at the time. Elozenam came on my show before he went to Big Brother. Mm. Um, Erica, you know, yeah. Ehiz was on my show. Mm. Tony Igo, um, Tosin Igo was mm. on my show. Like, so I had quite a number of like yeah. really good guests. And they were so, Bimbo Ademoye was on my mm. show at the time. And they would come and they would have such a good time. They'd be like, oh, I'll tell my friend. Yes. You know, obviously yes. that friend is a celebrity. So yeah. I'll tell my friend, I'll tell my friend. And that was how I was getting, you know, more. And my sister, the food was so good. That and she, the food even was if you know come before, if they tell you about the food. <laughs> so they, I feel like that was always the thing. <laughs> Like, oh, yeah. can cook. You get a cook. I like, she did cook die. The first time I came on the show, because I came from it, you know, we all were coming up at the time. Yeah. I, knew, I know you on Instagram, I used to follow. I said, let me go and support my friend. Even at the cooking show, I never had a cook- cooking show. What is she won't cook? Because I never saw you as a chef. I saw you as yeah. a TV presenter. Yes, true. So I'm just like, maybe she just wants a show that at least me she will just do day. something. <laughs> my sister said, they cook the food. I said, it's in the center. They said, ah, for this person yeah. we did. And I don't know how, it was so fast, so well done. I don't I think yeah, I used I, to make, make like fascinating things in one hour. Less than one hour, like uh, yeah. 30 something minutes. We we'll have a break. I see the cook and you go there just with us. Yeah, it was it was like good times. So you had Pop Central. Mm-hmm. You had your other job and you were working simultaneously. When did Pop Central end for you? Because you did a couple of seasons, right? Yeah, I did. I think I did about three seasons or four even. What? Because you wanted to be a TV presenter. I so how did you to... get to the point where you just made the decision that you know? I I'm going to leave this. I'm going to focus on something I else. I pray. I listened. I feel like God had spoken to Evelyn, spoken through my brother, because my brother had constantly told me mm-hmm. that, you know, I should sort of try to focus on food for a bit. Evelyn said, you see that exposure you're looking for? I feel like you get it when you start to cook. And I went through a really traumatizing experience and when I, I feel like when I had started to come out of that mm-hmm. in 2021, I decided to take my business seriously. So I created an Instagram page. My brother called his graphics designer to help me come up with a logo and, you know, everything. And I printed nylons. I got a dispatch bike because I, I saved up some money. Mm. I got a dispatch bike and I just, I started. I honestly just started. Just from I space. started, yeah. I mean, I didn't have any customers, but I started posting food that I was making for my friends because I used to always cook for my friends. Mm-hmm. So I started, I started posting food that I'd made for my friends. My brother and I were living together in our cubicle. So he would, every time I'm cooking, he would come and be hyping the food. He'd be like, this is the best, you know. He would talk about it. And those videos really did well. And over time, as I started, I'm not even joking, almost instantly, because I started around COVID. Mm, and that was the time. You, you know, know. He'd have to say that, you know, God works in serious ways. Yes, he does. You know, the thing where we say go blow us, not be the TV. Um, t- see, the TV blow I us. feel like God has an interesting sense of humor. Yes. Just because he, he'll just be looking at us and you'll just be doing what you can so and he'll be like, yeah, well, yeah, you know what? Just when you're done, when you're done with yourself, all of that nonsense, you come and do what I want come you and to do. do. What, oh, God. Because it could have, you could have blown from TV. I could have. 
You could have just moved from... No, and say you have all it takes. You're yes. very eloquent. I would write a script. Like, even till now, I feel like it's good for me now because when I do ads mm, and I, yeah. you know, I go for like commercial shoots mm. and things like that. They just call me one take queen. Because it's like... Oh, one time. girl, you were one... Like, I see they cook it. You did turn face the camera. You did talk it. There's no, let us take it again. It's back to this thing. Like, it was really like, like... It was just straight. Like, it was just going. And it was very, it was really incredible. So, I started doing food. Food was doing really well. I was making money. So, like, delivering to delivering people's houses. Delivering to people's houses, offices, bulk meals. I was sending meals abroad. Like, people would ah. order food. I would freeze food for days and send it abroad. People buy order food from... Yes. I knew people bring it UK. From... People want to travel. They'll be like, oh, I'm traveling next tomorrow. So can you help me freeze the moi moi? You know, and ah, and let me tell you the, the beauty. It's still bad. Let me tell you the beauty of, Wailu, of okay. this life is my mother's business had dwindled down. Really? So at this time, you were the one. My mother had not started Calabapot again. I was doing my food by Hilda. I think my mommy opened her business page when I was maybe on like thirty k followers or like fifty k followers. Okay, so it was now you that was doing the. Was she supporting you? Was she helping? No, I mean, I'm here. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But she's now trying. And I remember having a conversation with my mommy and reminding her that, mommy, you did this thing. You trained us through the best schools. through Because she had become really downcast. And she's like, you know how you were doing something and then you, yeah, you've you not been doing it again. And then now you've come to a new age. It's now yeah. Instagram. You're now, you don't know how to do content. And I'm like, mommy, you can't do it. So that time, I'll be posting my mommy on my page. I'll be posting, I'll be posting, Aww. I'll be posting. And I'll be like, Mommy, don't worry. Just keep at it. Some days she said, you don't get any order. I say, Mommy, is it not you? The food is good. You'll wow. get there. Now she sells out every day. Over a hundred. I don't know if she has even got 200k followers. She has a lot of followers. On Instagram. Yes, people know. Like, there are people that may not have known me. Obviously, they know me now. Yeah. But before now, they may not have known me, but they knew my mom. Yes. Like, mm. from her page. Mm. You know, and she has, again, and my mother's daughter, she has a very vibrant, exciting, yes. mm. interesting personality. Mm. So I feel like God was like, your blessing is in this food. Mm. Just focus on it. You know, it's good. Tell me about opening my food by Hilda. You know what was interesting? It's one thing for you to just book in online. It's one thing to not finally say, I'm establishing establishing this business as a physical entity. You can walk yeah. in and how did that happen? How much so, money did you even make to the point where you can now say, I'm gonna get a space in Lekki? Ah, uh, my dear. And also please talk about your, you know, I was teaching. your classes. My sister, that class is like, yeah, how much you did cash out for that <laughs> class is there. Uh, I got to find something where I'm going to teach people. Oh. I was teaching and I feel like, I don't want to sound cliche, but God, in honesty, I would say blesses you even more when your intentions are good. Because when I started teaching, I swear to you, I didn't think about money. Like, I wasn't mm. thinking about the profits of teaching. It was that I had been on TV, and on TV, I was teaching people to cook. Well, I didn't get the opportunity to do that anymore because mm-hmm. I was no longer on TV. And I kind of still wanted an audience. So I was still posting recipe videos on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And that was what gave rise to people now asking me, oh, do you teach? Do you teach? Do you teach? And then I sort of put out information for my first online class. And, you know, I remember I said it was 50K or something like that. And then... My brother is like, how are you going to be charging people 50K? You're just starting out, blah, 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 blah. And we did this whole video where he's like, Your brother's a voice price of slash for you. from 50K, 15,000 Naira. I remember then, I think I was teaching like 20 recipes. Look at me now that he's about to teach 160 recipes. But, but, but Hilda, are you not worried that, you know, if you teach people too much, they'll come Sabia, does he not take anything from you? Oh, that's not a fear for me. You know why? Because I didn't learn from anyone, mm. per se. You know, so it's like, Half the things that I know, I learned from experience. I made mistakes. I mm. practiced. I, you know, and I just kind of feel like if we don't teach, like I, I don't want what I know to die with me. I honestly don't because ideas are not like they're not um specific to just you. As you're thinking, the universe is also giving other people the same ideas. Mm. Maybe they're not in the same country as you, mm-hmm. but. I just honestly, like, I feel like one of the days that I decided to take teaching so seriously that I decided to add costing to my class was a lady had tried to order food for me, like bulk order for an event. 
and she, I gave her the bill and she was like, uh-uh, somebody here is charging 85K for this same package. And I, my heart bled for the person. I didn't know who that person was. But I was like, I know that there's no way this person is making money. And this person would do this business. This person would keep doing, this person would be busy every day. So the money will be flowing through your account, mm -hmm. but your lifestyle is not going to change right. because you're not doing it properly. And I'm like, no, nah, like, I don't think this is cool. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is when you now make money, people say, oh, you're doing money laundry mm. or you're doing this or you're doing that. There's no way in hell you can be making this kind of money because they're doing the same business and they're not making that right. kind of money. Right. And they're probably busier than you. Right. They probably cook every other weekend and you're, you're not even as busy as they are. Mm. And I'm like, no, I feel like this is information that people need to know. And not everybody is as exposed to be able to afford to go to Lagos Business School or go to Harvard <clears throat> Business School or basically just learn like the costing and the business side of it. So I'm like, no, nah, like people can actually like really learn from this. I remember the first meeting that you had at Econ. Yeah, you, you were there. And I'm just like, oh my God, this is a laudable initiative. Like, but how is she fucking going to How is she it? going to pull it off? You know, there was that. And when I started, I think when we were about maybe like, when I was maybe like 60 millionaire in, ha. You. I called my mother back. and let's I'm like, back. mommy, I don't think I I don't think this is why I, I that was when I told my mother I was actually like sixty. My brother did not know how much the cocathon was costing. Actually, I want to bring you back a bit. I don't think Nigerians even understand how much money went into went it. into doing it because the space you first got to first of all that's an expensive space. Yeah, the food, the cooking things, and everything. Why? So, for you to take that kind of risk, what if you had not won? I started prepping myself for an event that I lost. You know, I had said, you know, I've I've had booked town therapy. Like I was already telling my therapist, so like, prepare for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come back. You know, and just things like that. But it was so important to me to focus on the positive. So I didn't dwell too much on my negative thoughts. <laughs> when the negative thoughts got, got me was when the cookathon itself actually started. started. I think I talked about that quite in a number of interviews. But before then, it was just like, I can't see the light at the end of this tunnel. Like, where did I even put Start. myself in this? You know, it was that. But I was also very believing. Like, I remember having a meeting here at Econ, and I'm like, I said to them, how the days were going to go. I told them, guys, this is what's going to happen. On day one, we'll have my family and friends, primarily my family and friends. Maybe the press that we've, you know, solicited for, the ones we've paid for, we'll have them there. We'll have a couple of my students, a few fans here and there, a few people that, you know, registered um, on the microsites. And mm. day two, it'll be... A bit more chilled, but more people coming because it's weekend. Mm. It's a Friday. So we'll have a lot of people there. By day three, everyone will be like, I, I said, if I'm still there by day three, people everyone's going to be like, oh, she's serious. She's actually doing this. Yes. And then more people are going to be looking at their phones. Mm. And more people, people are going to be saying, oh, I wonder how far she's going to go. Mm. And I remember when I was trying to get like the best in companies to come on board, I said to them, this is when they'll start putting in their bets. Because people will now start saying, she's going to stop at 72 hours. You oh, she's going on, to stop at... It, that was the plan. But obviously, no yeah, betting yeah, company yeah, jumped on board. Yeah. But that was my... They so my thing was from day three, because technically it was five days, but by hours, it was four days. Mm. So I'm like, yeah, by day three, people are going to start placing their bets. More people are going to be interested. If we're going to get any form of national recognition from day three... That's where we're, that's when we're going to be everywhere, and. But how did you know all this? Did you, had you done research before? No, really, because in truth, no. But there is no Guinness World Record that has had has gotten this kind of attention it was in the crazy. history of. It's never happened. So yeah. even when I was telling them, these I, I, I obviously I wasn't thinking the president was going to tweet at me and whiskey and burner boy and my you know, sister. It, it, I I wasn't thinking that far. Mm. It was just more that more people were going to be interested and you yeah. know more people were going to be invested in the journey and mm. you know it was more that because again it was so important to me to not think about 
Yes. They, public, yeah. like, oh, you're be, about Valid. to become a star because mm. in an event that that doesn't happen, I had how to manage expectations? my expectations in terms of how far my personality was going to mm. go, you know, from this. It's because it, was, it, must, it must have been lots of mind... Mind, mind like, over like, myself, my brother. So, so, how did you pick your team? Because you had a fantastic team that <sighs> stood by you. Like, they were... You know, beyond the people that actually came to show support, you had a very strong team. I yeah. remember the guy that got popular, the chef that works with you, that was constantly Sonny, by your yeah, side. Yes, Sonny had worked with me. He had, he's, he still works at the restaurant, actually. So he had worked with me from the time I opened the restaurant. So I think he had worked with me for about a year. And, um, but I'd say primarily, putting the Alpha team together was nowhere's doing. Mm -hmm. I had to sell the dream to them. Nowhere made the conversations the charge, happen. Yeah. She called, like, she pretty much called every... I remember we had called a particular PR team. They were like, oh, come back to us when she's, she has... The dream is already well on its mm, way, you know? Mm. Not now. I I we don't like to, to jump on things. things. Let me, please, so I, I have to be forgiven. I was going through <laughs> mental, mental health issues, please. Yeah, actually, Teresa was actually... I was supposed to host, but I, I, was host mentally, I wasn't there. Like, even yeah. coming out to the cookhouse, I'm just like, if I don't support you, that she would think that this is beyond. <laughs> so please let me officially apologize for not... And that's that the thing. You. So I feel like quite a number of people, like a number of people felt the need to apologize to me. Yeah, like brands. Mm -hmm. I feel like for me, and I don't like to lie, maybe there's just one brand that you pay me small <laughs> that they did not come on board yeah. just because I had... No, it wasn't about them. It was because I just really liked the product. Yeah. And I had pretty much been championing that product just because I really liked it. Mm -hmm. So in truth, if you think about it, I was very much representing that brand. So it, it hurt me a bit that they didn't jump on board. But other than that, I don't go in, go through life assuming that people owe me anything. Because nice. I know that you're not going to get good treatment just because you're good. That's not how life works. So you said you know, treated so, you bad. Sorry? You said treated you bad. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't think you treated me bad. Because again, you didn't air me. You, mm. you were in my first meeting. Mm. And I sort of knew that, again... You can ask the people on the team. I went into this. Everybody was going to get paid. So I, nobody, I, I, I was, you know, so for me, it was, it's, I considered the, how much effort it was going to take from you. Because mm -hmm. it means you're going to be there. Initially, they wanted different hosts. I said yeah. to them, we're not mm -hmm. doing that. We want one person or two people that are there from the first day till the last day. Because it's like, I needed to show on their faces as well that we've been through a journey. Because yeah. this is not a joke. It's mm -hmm. not a glamorous event. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's glamorous maybe when you look at it from the outside. Mm -hmm. But in truth, the people that are experiencing this entire mm. journey, this is, mm. is not glamour. Yeah. This is, we're working. We're going to be suffering. You wouldn't sleep. Like, and you have to take notice of every single thing that is happening. So I knew that it was a huge commitment. Mm. And if you're not mentally there, you may not be able to give it your all. So mm. honestly, I wasn't, there were no hard feelings. At a point, I told the PR guys, like, stop reaching out to brands. I don't, I don't want it anymore. Because once you keep doing that, and you're getting a lot of negative feedback, it starts to almost Sit reflect down, on yeah. the dream. Mm. So you now start to look at the dream from the point of negativity, yes. from the negative um, feedback that you're getting and I did not want that because mm. I, I kind of I bet on this and I knew that it was what you know it was what the investment it was what my time so I, I just said to them you know don't talk to anybody again we'll pay for it but let's just see how we can get it like well on its way and off the road and let's just get it done once we're done we can figure everything else out let's talk about the event itself so yeah. day one of Kukaton mm -hmm. what where was your mind at and you know, for the f the first day, it was still people were still getting into it, like what's going on. By the second day, it was already a topic of conversation. By the third day, as you had predicted, everybody that was, wanted to yeah. be part. I mean, now nah, it's just because I, I didn't experience it. Me, I was because cooking. you just like cooking. I was inside but, but, there. By the time you're seeing everybody come in, the celebrities, the governors, everybody, what were you feeling like? I wasn't feeling like anything because I was just trying to make it through. You were you, probably yes. numb. Yeah, at a point, like maybe from like the ending of day three, I couldn't really see anybody, you know, I don't know. I couldn't make out anybody. I could make out my family and friends. I could make out the flashlights, but I couldn't really make out that much. Jesus Christ. You know, so it was, I, honestly, I, to say, I don't want to make it sound so extreme, but in a way, I was, in a sense, I was fighting for my life there because at that point, I was not going to quit. I had already done three days. There's no way I'm going to quit at 72 hours. 
there were times where I wanted to, but back in my head, it's like, you've already called. It's just like when you go for a meeting and you've waited mm. for like two hours and it's a meeting that you know that you've, you you've need. spent a lot, you suffer to get that meeting. Mm-hmm. You're not going to leave because you've waited for two hours. Because it means the two hours you've spent become useless. Right. So for me, that was kind of how it was. So it's like, you've done three days. You're not going to back back out now. But that's the only thing that stayed fresh in my memory. Everything else was just, I just need to, I just need to live. I just, I just need to survive and get through this. And then obviously seeing everybody there. I said it in like the promo videos. I'm, I'm going to be drawing from your strength. I actually did. Like there were times when I didn't have any energy. Or just looking at everybody there. Especially there was this day that it rained so much mm-hmm. in the night. And they were under the rain mm-hmm. with me. This was me concerned that they were under the rain. Mm-hmm. And they were like, no, just keep cooking. And... I'm like, no, I'm not going to waste this effort. Like, Mm. you couldn't have stayed under the rain Mm. only for me to stop now. I have to finish. You you know one thing that your your cookathon showed me? is how, amidst the chaos in Nigeria, very patriotic people. We love ourselves. We just, we're just faced with a lot of stress and, you know, but you you could see how everybody rallied. Even, Even people that probably didn't believe at the beginning or, it's just a thing where this is our own now. Like, and I feel like it wasn't even for clout. Like, it wasn't even a yes, clout thing. Yes, it was. Yes. It was very much... This is for us. This is for us. Like, yes. it, that. Was, I feel like that's what still stays with me. Like, mm. this thing is for us. Like, mm. this... If she makes... So, it was very... Everybody sort of personalized that yes, success. Yes, like, ah, yes. if she does this thing, yes. you know? I remember, like, till today I go out and then they're... Older women would reach me and they're like, oh, my son was watching you all the time. And he would come and say, mommy, pray for Hilda. And so down to when kids are invested, mm. it's, I said I wanted to make history. Like, this is history that I would be so proud yes, to tell my the children. Books. Like, to like to just be like, yeah, we did that. Like, at the end of the, when they recount the years, like, a Nigerian did that. Mm. Like, this one is for Nigeria. We actually mm. did that. Amazing. I'm so inspired by just even listening to you because, you know, the goalposts always keep shifting. It you know? will. Yeah. And to it, see that you will. actually on a, So it's one thing for you to actually know where you're going. It's another thing for you to work at it. I think you're doing both. And I'm, I'm so proud of you. I'm so Thank proud you. of the work that you've done over time. I'm and proud of you too. You've come you a long so way. much, my friend. You actually have come a long way. You're, and I like how, I feel like I respect intentional people a lot because it takes a lot to get to this point, to become a viral sensation and keep at it and make something of that, you know, viral moment and make it stand out and make it worthwhile. So you're not just the, the guy that did the spin me, mm. may sweet me video. Mm-hmm. It's like there's much more to you now. So if I'm to ask you, oh, what what have you done since that time? That, like there's a lot more yeah. that you can say about yourself and say about your name and say about what you're doing and where mm. you're going. And that's not easy. Mm. It's actually not easy, especially in this industry mm. because there's so many distractions. It's so easy to get carried Girl, away. tell me about it. You know, there's a, there's a strong desire to be liked. There's a strong desire to be relevant. You know, there's a... So I just feel like it's so difficult to be in this space, become a viral sensation and still focus on the what and the why mm. and what your goals are and stick to them so I honestly I respect you a lot for being able to do that thank you so you know, much thank you so much You're for make having me, cry. me. <laughs> I had a good time I didn't think uh, I was going to be talking for this long of course this is, you know? this is what we do here we bring the tea acid hot but I, I thank you for sharing and one of the things that I really wanted to talk about was your journey because I know you from way back and mm-hmm. also so that anybody that's watching this thing is also also knows that you know Success takes time and it, it takes does. a lot of experience and growing and mm-hmm. and to see that you finally got here with all the I don't think you would have done this thing four years ago and gotten it right. So I have. it was good that I'm she went through the process me. that she went through. I honestly thought you were gonna blow from TV. Like I don't a lot of people don't know that you did TV, but I thought you were I gonna even be acted, a, I act film. <laughs> ah, different film. Yeah. Not be one film. I try. You try, but God makes good things good in this time. And, yes. And, Congratulations, Hilda. I can't wait for what you will do going forward. Um, yes, as my TV f- presenter friend, please help me sign out on the show. 
Hello everyone. Um, thank you so much. You've been on Tea with Tay with Hilda Bassi and the wonderful Tammy San. I hope you had a good time, you know, listening to this episode, watching this episode. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, drop a nice comment. Let us know who you would want to see, you know, on this beautiful seat next week or, you know, anytime. Let us know any questions you'd like for us to ask them. Until next time, have an amazing day and goodbye.